So, Jim, we're recording now. I'm sorry, what? We're recording. Okay, great. Yes, here I am in my archives, and yes, that is a Bacardi box behind me. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> It's pH balanced, right? Perfect. So uh, don't be insulted if I mute you once things start. Oh, absolutely. I'm, I'm used to that. Okay. I'm a, I'm a married man. Oh, well, uh, it's not nearly that bad. No, I would have left. <laughs> All right, every, thank you so much for coming. It's been a couple months since we've been here, so I appreciate everybody coming back. It's great seeing you. Uh, give a couple announcements about things coming up. On September 1st, we're having a program on the Eastland. It's a Friday at 2 p.m. It's a members only program. It's gonna have Jocelyn Green, who's written a book on the Eastland, as well as the Eastland Disaster Historical Society will be giving their presentation. So that's gonna be a real nice afternoon about the Eastland on September 1st. Then uh, please mark the calendars on Thursday, October 26th is going to be the annual CMM Festival, our main fundraiser for the year. Should have a lot of fun things going on. Please go to the website at the events page to find out more information about that. Uh, there's opportunity to be here at the museum for it or online. So please mark that. Um, as always, we sincerely thank Kath Thomas for her great job. Uh, on the food back there. Uh, um, if any of you are not members yet, we'd love for you to become. Um, if not, that's okay. We also have opportunities for anybody to volunteer. If somebody would like to volunteer, please talk to me afterwards or talk to anyone at the front desk and we'll be sure to discuss the opportunities with you. Okay, um, let's see. For everybody at home, please make sure you're muted. And uh, tonight, the reason we have this presentation tonight is this year is the 350th anniversary of the Marquette and Joliet expedition. So part of that, our speaker tonight, Mark Wolzinski, has a new book on the topic. And uh, you know, I first got to know Mark when he was pretty regularly a presenter at the uh, conference on Illinois history. Every year he'd be there with a new paper. They were all fascinating, very impressive. Mark's been a college professor. He's worked for the DNR. He's the uh, park historian for the Star, Star Rock Foundation. Um, just fascinating guy all around. So tonight we're very pleased to have him present on Marquette's 1673 map, places featured and issues. So please welcome Mark Wolzinski. <laughs> Make sure I got enough water to spill. There we go. All right, fantastic. We need to. Oh, on the screen. Got it. Got it. Oh, oh, on this one. Too many There we go. Usually, I like to bring my um, technical support crew, uh, my setup crew. And uh, but she can't make it tonight. <laughs> so, <laughs> in her stand in front of the yeah. camera. There's something uh, there's something about me and bad mojo when it comes to computers, but we try to get along. And I've actually invented new cuss words when it comes <laughs> to computer. I hate to do that, but but uh, I have been dragged kicking and screaming into the computer world. Can everybody hear me? Okay. If you can't, just yeah. all right. I. I'm, I usually like to flail my arms around and yell rather than sit behind a microphone, uh, especially like on Zoom. It kind of remind me back in the 80s. Remember, they used to have Max Headroom on the TV <laughs> show, so it kind of reminds me of myself. Anyway, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, it means a lot to me when when people are interested in a really cool subject like this. Um, like Jim said, I every time I give a presentation, people say, what did you bring books? 
Well, I do have some. So in case you're interested, there's no obligation or anything. I don't make any money off this. This is university press material. So they get it. So anyway, so we're going to look at Marquette's 1673 map. And there's a lot of information about this. This is just one little teeny snippet that comes from the book. And some of these things are not confrontational, not, not really issues at all. But when we get towards the issue part is the reason why I wrote that book. And that's because there are questions uh, about the expedition that most of the earlier books written from the 1960s up to 1970 kind of left hanging or it didn't really seem right. So what I did is I wrote this book to be able to answer these questions the best we can. And I'm not dogmatic about things. What I try to do is to suggest uh, using the evidence, the best possible answer or solution to these things. So let's take a look. And on. And I just need the old fashioned way. First Come on, baby. <laughs> this is when the pattern goes up. Right about the time my telephone rings. This <laughs> one. See, I told you, Mad Mojo. I wasn't joking, was I? Okay. Well, there she going. Ah, I don't know what I did, but there it is. The map itself, okay? That's the map right there. Uh, 1673, uh, Jacques Marquette. He was quite the guy. He's the author. The map was part of Marquette's report, annual report. It wasn't like he was sitting around one day wondering what to do with himself and draw a map. No, the map is part of his annual report. See, Jesuit missionaries, since they're all scattered throughout the north and at the Indian villages and stuff, they were required every year to write an annual report on what you did, okay? Where were you at? What was the name of the tribe? Could you speak that language? How many people did you baptize? How many people were in the village? Did you find out anything about the rivers or lakes or anything beyond that village. And so they were required to do that. So this journal that you can actually read it on the, uh, you can go to the internet and read it in a pretty good English translation, um, wasn't a journal. It was his actual annual report that was required by Jesuit law. So after the missionaries would send this stuff to, to uh, Quebec, then the head Jesuit, in this case, a man by the name of Claude de Blanc, he would edit it. He would add things, he would take away things, and then he would take these in what's called a short catalog and then send them to Paris. And they would be edited and introductions added, and then they would end up in Rome. The map is actually quite small, almost like a legal pad. Uh, and it's on vellum, which is animal skin. A lost art. There's only a handful of people that know how to make that stuff these days. Um, Lucien Campo, who is one of the great Canadian uh, uh, historians, matter of fact, I think he's even a knight, uh, he points out a number of things on this map. For example, a few observations uh, near Lake Superior are unanimously recognized as the very calligraphy of Marquette. You can't really see that writing up there. But we know that that's Marquette's. It's Marquette's handwriting. There has been some people dating back to 1923. Uh, Franciscan by the name of Steck, he wrote a book and it's basically a well-written book. Unfortunately, a lot of the information is kind of strange. Like this was a conspiracy. Marquette didn't do this as a conspiracy to rob Joliet for his real do. Anyway, stuff like that. And um, we know this map has been checked out by experts. This is the real McCoy. And we're gonna explain later on how we got to that. This map 
arrived in Quebec in the year 1675. Okay? And what Marquette does is you have to realize that before the Jesuit missionaries came to today's Illinois country, they were up in the upper Great Lakes area for 40 years. These guys were fluent in what we would call Algonquian, not Algonquin, Algonquian language, Ojibwa. Ojibwa is another name for the Chippewa. Uh, and so these people were fluent in that language. So like Marquette, he would actually write down things like up there in the Ojibwa language and things down here in the Illinois language. Okay, this is kind of kind of cool. So what's the background on Marquette? Well, he went to Jesuits universities. Now universities at that time are not like the universities of today. He was nine years old when he began going. These were the best schools in France, okay? Probably the finest schools in Europe at the time. This is where the royalty and the nobility sent their kids to go to school, to become ship's captains, to become um, diplomats, to become generals, to become you know, big administrators in the French government. And this Jesuit education was, is really remarkable because we're talking about a period of the counter-reformation. And so there was, you know, it was kind of how far are we going to go with this material? Well, the Jesuits were pretty good about it because we know Marquette likely took a course of instruction, three years in philosophy. And philosophy, remember, science is a new word. They didn't have science at that time. They called it natural philosophy. Instruction in philosophy, which included logics, physics, metaphysics, mathematics, mathematics being an umbrella term for geography, astronomy, hydrography, and astrology. They didn't believe in astrology that, hey, you're going to meet somebody who's going to give you a lot of money today. Nothing like that. Their astrology just meant segments as the planets move. This period is whatever, this period of Sagittarius, this period, it had nothing to do with the stuff that we uh, kind of look at it today. In the Jesuit world, the theological studies came last, very last. Yes, they had to take their early vows. Yes, they had to learn the prayers. Yes, they had to learn how they fit in the order, but the actual deep things came very last at the end of their education. And the Jesuits were basically the Marine Corps of the Catholic religious orders. It took at least 13 years to become a full-fledged Jesuit. In fact, Marquette was so good at the above mentioned things, mathematics, sciences, and things like that, about learning the religious things, Marquette actually wrote that he felt a repugnance to getting up to the speculative sciences. In other words, theology. And by nature and disposition, I am no too well suited for them. So yes, he learned those things, but this was really not as bailiwick. So Marquette's in the schools, had a number of different Jesuit schools in France, and he wrote twice to J.P. Oliva, who was the head Jesuit, the Jesuit, asking to be sent to the foreign missions, because the Jesuits had missions in China, they had them in Portugal, they had them all over the place, and they had them in the New World. But Marquette wanted to go before he got too old, because this is a rough life. Sometimes, as other Jesuits like Claude Jean Alloues wrote, that uh, he had to subsist on rotting deer flesh of a dead deer carcass that he found, fish bones, and things like that. So this is not the work for a for uh, an old timer. This is he takes young people to do this kind of stuff. But he hadn't finished his theological training, but he was allowed to leave, okay? And he arrived in September in Quebec in 1666. Okay? He took his final Jesuit vows in 1671. So he arrives in Quebec. 20 days later, now he's going to learn instruction in Native American languages and the culture and kind of the do's and don'ts, okay? If you're gonna to speak to these people and try to convert them, to Catholicism, you've got to speak their language. And what makes it completely difficult is because their language doesn't have words for these religious things. Original sin. 
vicarious atonement, you know, things like that. So these, these Jesuits have got to know that language so well, these native languages uh, so well that they have to be able to try to describe this stuff to even put prayers together for these people to say. So he got his basic training, okay? The do's and don'ts of ministering to the Native Americans. Now, we know when we get back to the 1673 map, we know that Marquette not only had the educational training to do this, to build, to draw a map, but he had experience doing so. For example, Marquette and Claude Jean Alloues drew or at least collected information for the famous um, Jesuit map of Lake Superior. And that happened during the summer of 1668. That was Marquette's first summer and where he spent the summer in Sault Ste. Marie. Um, they collected this information, okay? So how do we know this? Now, this is one of these issues that has become a discussion. Who drew this map, okay? Here's the best clue that we have. Claude de Blanc, who was the Jesuit superior of Canada wrote, it was drawn by two rather intelligent and exacting fathers who did not try to put down anything that they hadn't seen. So is he just being coy or is he talking about somebody else, okay? This here, this scene right here, this would be the South Shore of Lake Superior where the Jesuit mission of La Pointe was, okay? So who were these two fathers? Well, some people say it had to be Father de Blanc. It had to be Alouette. Marquette was too young to do this. But the problem is, is there was only three Jesuits in the West at that time. Alouette, Marquette, and Father Nicholas. And Nicholas left that whole area in the spring of 1668, which leaves Alouette and Marquette. Yeah, but what about the blonde? Well, he didn't get there. He didn't arrive in the Western country until 1669, okay? So this map I'm going to show you right there is the work of Marquette and Alouette, okay? This is really cool. Like I say, they didn't mean to draw a map of Lake Superior. What they did is draw the places where there were villages, Native American settlements that were dependent on that La Pointe mission on the, on the south shore of Lake Superior. What's really cool about this map is that's a pretty darn good map for a couple of guys in a birch bark canoe that had a quadrant and a compass. They're dead reckoning. Yeah, that's about a mile. Counting paddle strokes and things like that. That's a pretty tall order to make a map just like this. When you look at these early maps, you'll notice that they are usually pretty accurate this way. This one here's a half a degree off, but they're usually pretty accurate this way because latitude doesn't really change. What changes is longitude. These people were aware of longitude, but the problem is they didn't have a proper timepiece in order to do longitude. So the maps are usually pretty accurate this way, but way off this way. Okay, but even considering, that's pretty darn impressive. <coughs> the map, the 1673 map was actually, it illustrates the route of Marquette and Joliet's voyage, okay? It includes Indian villages, features such as rivers, lakes, and rapids and stuff. And the map, as I said, was part of his written report. It wasn't separate, it was part of his annual report. Unlike LaSalle, and this is the difference between Marquette, Marquette was a pretty cool guy. When he went to a village, he kind of went to blend in. He wasn't controversial. He tried to win them over by his, just his, his, the way he did things, okay? He was kind of meek, kind of mild, as opposed to alleyways where he was about to get run out of some Indian villages. And LaSalle, who was the ultimate... Um, self-promoter, I guess we can say. <laughs> and what Marquette wrote in the narrative of his report matches what's on his map. LaSalle wrote letters to the governor, letters to friends, letters to investors, and all that information is irreconcilable with one of the maps he drew. Okay, so Marquette's a pretty straightforward guy. So let's look at a couple of these places. 
Okay. One of the first, first things they did, hey, I got something here, is when he left St. Ignace right over here, they went under the Mackinac Bridge and went along the coastline into today's Green Bay. Okay. And they got to the Menominee River right there. Menominee River is today's dividing line between uh, Wisconsin and the Upper Peninsula near today's Menominee, Michigan or Marinette, Wisconsin. Um, was the Menominee Indians lived there and the French called them Falevin, the wild oats people or wild rice people, okay? Now Marquette told them, because he could speak their language, he says he was going to a distant nations to teach them the mysteries of his faith. Uh, Menominees didn't like that. And Menominees had already met several other Jesuits. So Marquette and Julia were not new to these, to these people. Uh, and they told him, look, uh, you don't think you want to go there because there's hostile warriors, navigational habits, river monsters, and a giant demon who would block their path. Okay, and, and if they survived all of that, the summer heat would surely kill you. A lot of these Indian tribes did not want people going farther because they, lots of times they hoped that they can get their trade goods. The French would trade with them, which would give them power over the other tribes acting as middlemen, okay? <clears throat> Now, here's one of the things that we find out in the report. At that village, and Marquette, at the beginning of his voyage, wrote a lot of stuff down. He went into detail. But one of the things that you have to consider, too, is his boss, Claude de Guan, was the guy who edited this report. Okay, And so Marquette wrote about, at this village, how these uh, the, the Indians who lived there how they harvest wild oats, how they clean them, how they do all these things like this. But the problem was Marquette was not at that village at that time. Marquette was there like in May, possibly early June, and they do the harvesting of this stuff in September or so, right about when his boss was there. So this is probably one of those sections when you read that paragraph or two, it's probably not even Marquette's at all. It's his boss sticking in there. So why would his boss do something like this? Why would his boss embellish Marquette's report? Well, it was common because the reason why the Jesuit, these are called the Jesuit relations. You can look them up online. You can go to the library. You can read Marquette's own report. The reason why they did that is they're having a hard time getting Frenchmen to come to Canada. Why would you want to leave? Leave. Man, you have it pretty good over there sometimes, okay? And you come here, you have to worry about the Iroquois killing you. It's going to take you 10 years to clear this property before you can plant your first crop. It's cold. The ground is miserable. So how do we get people? How do we induce people to go there? Well, we publish these reports from the missionaries, put them together, and we publish these things so that the young guys back home and say, man, that really looks cool. I could do that. And so that's one of the reasons why they publish these Jesuit relations. We're all the beneficiaries of that. So they continued down Green Bay and they got to the mouth of the Fox River, the lower Fox River, right here at this place. The rapids on the Fox River, and this was, there was a Jesuit missionary called the St. Xavier's Mission. Um, Father Andre and Father Alioues, who worked out of that mission, were not there when the French guys went by. Marquette didn't even mention the village or this mission site. Why should he? There's nobody there. It's a couple of empty huts. Okay. And then they continued upstream through the lower Fox River. Then they went through Lake Winnebago. Lake Winnebago is Wisconsin's largest inland lake. It's just a wide spot in the Fox River, is all it is. And when you go back into the Fox River from Lake Winnebago, you are now in the upper Fox River. And they landed at a place right near today's Berlin, Wisconsin. You see, Wisconsin screws up names just like Illinois does. Not Berlin, it's Berlin. That's with us, it's not Cairo, it's, or Cairo, it's Cairo, so on and so forth. And they had a, they ran into a great big village at Marquette called the Muscutin Indians village from the Muscutin Indians. We know that today as the Springview site. Archaeologists call it the Springview site, 47. Green Lake 132. And that's a picture of the site right there. Okay. The mission of St. Jacques was founded 
my father, Ali Wazer, a couple of years before Marquette got there. And it was one of these multi-tribal villages. You got to realize what's going on in a Native American world at this time. The Iroquois Indians were the most powerful fighting force in the North American continent, most organized, just unbelievable powerhouse. Well, when they went to wrestle the fur trade from the Great Lakes, because they killed everything out in their upper New York state area, now we're going to take their furs or get their furs or divert the furs to us so we can buy things because fur was the money. Nobody had money. He had furs. Okay. So when the Iroquois went to war and pushed all of these tribes from Michigan, Ohio, um, Pennsylvania, Ontario, west, until those tribes fleeing the Iroquois ran into what they call the Iroquois of the West, the Sioux. So they're pinched in between these two powerhouses, Native American armies like that. That's why Wisconsin has so many different Indian tribes in it. Okay, they were from other places and got scrunched in between these two powerhouses. So this was a multi-tribal village. The Illinois lived there, Miami lived there, Potawatomi, some Potawatomis maybe, Kickapoo lived there, and the Muscoot Indian. And it was a refugee camp. It was a place for trade. And it was also a hiding spot. You know these, when these places are hiding spots, because I'll show you another one, is when there's warfare, Native Americans will either go out to an island, because to get to, you have to go through that open territory. They didn't have life insurance. <laughs> so dad got killed. There's going to be some problems, okay? So they sold their lives dearly, okay? So it's one of the places they would go. If that there really weren't any sufficient islands like that, they would go to a place like this. This, this village is actually about a mile from the river, from the Fox River. It's hidden back there, okay? Both Marquette and Joliet actually spoke to the people in this into in this this village, multi-village, multi-ethnic uh, area. But this was the end of Joliet's limit. This is as far as he could communicate with these tribes. He knew some Algonquin Ojibwa and he knew some Montane, but this is as far as he can go. So when people say, oh yeah, you know all these Indian languages. No, he didn't. He knew the languages up by Quebec. So when he got to Wisconsin, now he's out of their range, okay? And from there, they got a couple of Miami guides because the French at this point has been to as far as any Frenchman has ever gone. Native Americans lived there for 12,000 years, but no Europeans did. And they were entering territory that they didn't know much about. You can see how what the French would do, they would use sometimes like, like a letter eight right here to make particular sounds. So that's how he would write Muscoutin right there. And it was located on a hill about a mile away from the river. Uh, because here, like I say, it's a more of a re refugee camp, but the, you got to have water for these people. In these Indian villages, what we fail to consider is, is how they were aware of some things in nature, like you don't breed with your relatives, things like that that the European monarchs at that time didn't know yet, okay? They knew that, that's why they had a clan system. And they had to have water, no water, no nothing. And they knew they had to have particular kind of water, aerated water. They couldn't go to some lake or something that were stagnant because everybody would end up getting sick and died. So they had to have a local water source and that's, a 1906 picture of that water source. There's a big spring up there. Marquette even mentioned him as he was walking past it. He dipped down and took a drink out of this. So something this big, the Indians that lived there at the time probably dug it up and kept the water running. Because if you don't keep a, if you got a spring coming out of the side of hill, if you don't dig it up and keep it going or put a pipe in it or something, you will eventually just turn into a little wet spot. So that was probably the water source for that village. Next place they went is they stopped and met with the Pewa Awewa. Pewa Awewa. That's the people we call the Peoria. That's what they called themselves, Pewa Awewa. 
somehow the French twisted that into Peoria. Then they twisted it into Ape. And so they were great at taking words this long and making them this long. And quite frankly, I don't blame them. There were two Illinois Indian villages living here at this very spot right here. And they were, this is right at the border of Iowa and uh, Missouri, at the far corner of Clark County, Missouri. Okay. There's, it had to be a multi tribal or multi ethnic. Illinois group, and keep in mind that when we talk about the Illinois, we talk about the Sioux, we talk about the Iroquois, when we say the name, oh, those are Illinois, those are Miami, those are Iroquois, those, that's just an umbrella term for all these different little groups. They have the same customs, same culture, they speak the same language, and they intermarry. Collectively, we call them the Illinois, and you've probably heard of some of these Illinois groups, Peoria, Kaskaskia, Camarilla, Cahokia, these are all Illinois groups, okay? So these were, Marquette noted this place as being a Peoria village, but there was about 6,000 people and there never were 6,000 Illinois or Peoria's there. So they had to have some of the other Illinois. We know them, that site is the Haas and Hagerman sites, okay? Roughly 6,000 people or so. This village they stopped at, it's really kind of cool because they, they pulled their canoe up on shore because they saw a path going into the woods as they walked and walked and walked, they got to a spot where they're right here. People are right here. They don't see us. We can hear them talking. Now what do we do? If you ask, I'll tell you about a situation I had just like that one time <clears throat> later on. But they, oh well, what do you do? He commended their spirits to God and yelled out. And so here come the people running towards them. And here are two guys dressed really weird. Okay. A Frenchman and a Jesuit wearing his black outfit. Okay. So it's kind of neat. Uh, Marquette wrote about his, his and Joliet's experience, about the Illinois customs, about the Calumet and more. But this is what's really important. People haven't picked up on this. They were given a boy. They were giving, given a young boy. And we're going to discuss him later. It's really pretty cool. So Joliet and Marquette spent one night at the site. So where is the water source for that village? A great big oxbow lake, clean, clear body of water. And this is not on the Mississippi River. They had to go a little ways up the Des Moines River and walk about a mile and a half to get to that site. So that's when you know that's a refugee site. That's a hiding spot from the Iroquois or the Sioux. Uh, as they continue south from Missouri, they pass what we call the Piasaw. That's that griffin looking thing down by Alton, Illinois. And they had two scrapes, one with the Mansapalea and another one with the Michigamia tribes. Okay. Um, started out, they gave the chiefs back at that Peoria village, gave them a calumet, a green calumet. And this calumet is your get out of jail free card. Okay, because all Indian villages, all forts were all on the rivers. The rivers were Lakeshore Drive. The rivers were Interstate 80. So people, when they went down those rivers, you had to stop at those villages. And sometimes those people did not want you in your village. But if you held up that pipe, yeah, okay, he's cool, fine. And so that's what they did. So that pipe had a lot of, a lot of good medicine to it. It was cool too, these Michigamias that they almost shot it out with, come really close, became part of the Illinois Indians about 25 years later. So they continued south all the way to Arkansas, to the Arkansas River, okay? And keep in mind, Joliet, it was, it was common to have a well-educated worldly priest or missionary that had an education like Marquette had and pair them up with a secular person as well, because France and Canada was essentially church states at that time. They were both vying for power, okay? And so every time an explorer went out, he had missionaries in his canoe. When the missionaries went out, they lots of times had secular people with them as well. And that's why we have Joliet, because he was a relative newcomer to the West. He was not this well-traveled guy. Later on in life he was, but not at this point. So Joliet, who owns a trade post, is looking every time they stop at a village, you know he's looking, man, they got guns there. I wonder where they got those guns. Well, they got this. Where they got that? 
Okay, so he's keeping his eye out for that, okay? So they're about 700 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. And one of the things that they had to do is figure out, and we'll talk about this in a minute, which sea the river dumps into. And they were, the Indians told me, that's right down here, about 10 days, actually a lot more than 10 days, it would have been 700 miles. But they were warned that there may be Spanish down there. And there are some really hostile tribes down there. And looking around this village, they thought, you know what, I think these guys are right. We have collected my minerals. We collected, they probably had dead animal specimens and plants. Marquette is taking all these latitude readings and writing all this stuff down. They collected a lot of information and they knew that that river dumps into the Gulf of Mexico. So they turned around and headed back north, okay? And this is where they came. This is where the Illinois River empties into the Mississippi River. And the best evidence indicates that they arrived here on August 25th, 1673. Well, how do you know that? Marquette didn't write that. Well, here's the thing. The Jesuit missionaries, or even, even other missionaries too, would typically name places on the feast day of the saint when he arrived there. Lake St. Clair, north of uh, Detroit. Father Hennepin named that Lake St. Clair because they arrived there on the feast day of, of uh, St. Clair. Alluage, St. Jacques Mission, St. Xavier Mission, named all those places in Wisconsin on the day he arrived there. Now, they arrived the feast day of St. Louis, and this is Louis the Ninth, not Louis the Fourteenth, who lived during the 1200s, he was a crusader. His feast date is August 25th. And the earliest recordings of the Illinois River, it's called the River St. Louis. So even though we can't have metaphysical certitude, we can say that it's probably a pretty good bet that they arrived there on the 25th of August. Then they went up the Illinois River to this place here, right by Star Rock is right about there on the other side of the river, okay? A place called Kaskaskinki, okay? Kaskaskia, the French turned that into Kaskaskia. That's this large Indian village called 11 LS 13, if you're taking notes. And here's the thing, other people, and this is another reason why I wrote this book is because the Kaskaskia had to be expecting them. Okay, How, why do you say that, Mark? I say that because you have these scattered Illinois groups. You have Peorias and others living there. You have the Camarola, which were or the Morola, living somewhere near the Kankakee River. You have the Kaskaskias here. These people are of the same group, the same alliance. If you ever heard the word Illiniwek, get rid of it, delete it from your hard drive of your brain, and then empty the recycle bin. Okay, I'll ask, ask me about this at towards the end here, but later on, okay? So these people went on communal buffalo hunts together. They had feasts where the young men would meet the young women. That's when we do, that's when we do this. When they had festivals, when they had, they had constant communication. When they hear that, man, the Iroquois might be coming here. You better talk to these other guys here and, and get them there and we'll see how we're gonna do this. So there was constant communication between these Illinois groups, okay? And it is, I, it's, it's only uh, logical to believe that when those Frenchmen left that village up there in Missouri, somebody went to the Illinois here at Kaskaskia and told, hey, the French guys are here, because that also meant trade goods. Trade goods that these people would have to go all the way up to Northern Michigan or Sault Ste. Marie to get, okay? Even though Marquette's dressed as a missionary, that missionary means a trader is going to soon be with him. And now we want them people here. This is big news. This is a brand new super Walmart being opened up, okay, <laughs> if you will. And this village at the time had 74 cabins or roughly 1,480 people, give or take 200. And one of the reasons for the French, this village is why the French came to this part of the world, that village by Star Rock State Park. Why? Trade, of course, to make money, but conversion. Now, I mentioned that they published the Jesuit relations to get the young French guys to come to Canada, okay? Uh, British had blockades up in the North Sea, and it, it just wasn't working out very well. So the object was, is to convert 
the natives into good Catholics and then turn them into Frenchmen. So the job of the missionary, the role of the missionary grew from, oh, you want to convert them? Well, that's cool. But to, man, we got to convert these people to turn them into Frenchmen, okay, to grow the colony. So this place here was the focus for the French in this part of North America, okay? Uh, and while they were at that village, they got guides to take them to Lake Michigan, okay? Matter of fact, I'm right down there right out here. So let's look at a couple of features. Kind of cool. Uh, while they were paddling up the upper, upper Fox River, the crew stopped to pick an antidote for snake bite. Snake root that grows in Wisconsin. They said, man, snakes just absolutely hate that stuff. Okay. So why is that important? It's important because I was able to reconstruct in my book, chapters four through seven, you were going to ride in a canoe with Marquette and Joliet. Okay, and a, a lot of that has to be reconstructed from the reports and writings of people who came shortly after them that took the same route. Okay, so later travelers at what's called the, uh, the Wisconsin Portage, at today's Portage, Wisconsin, where the, where the Fox River of Wisconsin meets the Wisconsin River, that little portage in between there, it was infested with rattlesnakes. And they just happened to stop and pick this stuff here as an ant. So it's kind of, Marquette didn't say it, but it's just like, hmm, that's interesting. They just pick a bunch of snake root and you're going to a place full of rattlesnakes, which is kind of cool. Um, he wrote that this portage is 2,700 steps. Okay. Me, I'm going to make sure that this is the exact spot where that portage was. My wife, she's a great person. She followed me in the car. And I, would, <laughs> I would yell out my steps to her because I didn't want to get to like 1,583. Like, uh, is that 15 or 1,600? <laughs> so um, she helped me count these steps. Uh, I counted 3,280 steps. Okay, Marquette's either a really big dude and has a long stride, or uh, this is not the same portage. Well, come to find out, that it was not the Portage site there. If you go to the Portage in Portage, Wisconsin, it was a little bit farther south there, a couple hundred yards, okay? And just look at the minute accuracy of that Portage on the map. On the right here, we got right over here. And then here, I mean, even the directions, and it's, there's your 2,700 steps right there, which is really, really cool, minute detail. So, Another feature were these rapids on the Mississippi. This is another thing. This is another really cool information here. Um, Marquette didn't seem to write much about rapids, okay? And we're gonna get into the rapids, but what he did do on the map, and this is just recently found, is that these dots, this is the Mississippi River right here, okay? See those little dots right there? Those are islands, but, you see in a couple of these places, there are lines there, all these lines, those are rapids, which is really, really cool, okay? Um, and if, for a study on that, Birthday and Etymology of the Place Named Missouri by Michael McCafferty, okay? And what's also really cool is the reason why there's dams, for example, on the Illinois River, is the ramp, the dams were where the rapids were, like Star Rock and, and the Mars Sales, okay? So if you look at where those lines are on Marquette's map, those correspond to Lock and Dams 10, 11, and 19 on the Mississippi River. So that's pretty cool. Um, then he ran into the Missouri River, and this is the name he called the Missouri River. I'm not even going to try that one there. And they noticed as right near St. Louis, they saw whole logs and trees and even small islands dumping into the Mississippi from the Missouri. And Marquette referred to the Missouri River as that Pekawitanwi, which means it flows muddy. And that's probably Miami, Illinois, right there. One of the jobs that, or one of the tasks that Louis Joyer had to figure out and to find was the Mississippi and Ohio rivers, okay? The people who spoke Iroquois, 
that lived in New York, Pennsylvania, and over there, talked about this great river that goes to the sea. It's called Ohio. Hmm. Well, the people who live in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan talk about this great river called Mississippi. Two different languages, okay? Like the difference between Portuguese and Chinese, two completely different languages. Is the Mississippi the same as the Ohio? Or are they two different streams? So that's one of the things that Joliet had to find out. And where does this river flow? All rivers flow to the sea somewhere. Which sea does this river flow into? Okay. And they arrived at the mouth of the, right there, Ubuk Iku, otherwise known as the Ohio River. And what's really cool about it is when it comes to people that, when the French arrived, they wrote stuff down. There were 37 lodges in that village. These people eat this. The village is over next to this island. They wrote everything down. And that's what brought us into what's called the historic period. Since the last ice age, there's five periods of human history in our part of the country right here. Paleo, Archaic, Woodland, Mississippian, in historic. We are living in the historic period. And when Marquette and Joliet went through there and wrote this stuff down, it brought us into the last period of human history since the last ice age. So what do we know about the people who lived here before the French came out? Well, for, unfortunately, <clears throat> the best way is through archaeology, but archaeology has a lot to do with the interpretation as well. Another thing that we use is linguistic analysis of Native American words. For example, the pre-1673 Miami, Illinois, if you're wondering, Miami and Illinois were the same tribe. I don't know how I ever got associated with Florida. The Miamis were from around here. The name for the Ohio was that name right there. <laughs> I'm really, uh, okay, which means Kawpaw River. But the problem was the Kawpaw, Kaws, Omaha's, it's the same group, okay? They didn't live there. They lived in Texas, in Arkansas, in places down there. So why did they call the Ohio River that? It shows that at one time, these people lived five, six, eight hundred miles away. But the Indians still called it by that tribal name, which is really pretty cool. And the cognate Shawnee name for the Ohio translates as the Kaw River. So it all comes together. I'm not a linguist, but uh, one of my colleagues is, and this stuff is just absolutely fascinating. And you can see, this would be that name, but you notice all the letter eights like that. It's kind of cool. Uh, the lower Illinois River, this is also pretty cool. Look how it goes. It's when they entered the Illinois River, kind of goes up and shoots up that way. That's fascinating, okay? Now, Keep that right here. Joliet, I think you got a copy of the same map right, out, right outside the door here. In 1675, Joliet met with a map maker, actually not a map maker, but a calligrapher, not a cartographer, to draw a map of the areas where they went because Mark Joliet lost Marquette's stuff on a canoe wreck. I'll talk about that later. And look at his version of the Illinois River, okay? Marquette's. Joliet's there. And then for another century, this is 1771. Look, the Illinois River, they went with Joliet's reporting. These are actual maps from the period. Marquette's map was very accurate considering the time and the circumstance, okay? But there's a reason for why people use these crummier maps and not Marquette's good one, okay? It's kind of a neat little story. Uh, the map, that Marquette drew in 1673, arrived in Quebec in 1675. But in 1773, the Jesuits were banished from Canada. 1763, they were banished from Illinois. 1759, they were banished from Portugal. They got a little bit too powerful, okay? They were the largest landowners and slaveholders in Illinois at that time. So, the Jesuits were banished in 1773. However, Marquette's report and Marquette's map was stashed away 
by the hospital nuns and these different nuns that still, they weren't Jesuits, they're nuns that took care of the hospitals, the Ursulines and that up in Canada. They hid that, they, they kept that stuff. And when the Jesuits were allowed to come back to Canada in 1842, here's your maps guys, here's your stuff. They saved it because the British probably would have destroyed it, okay? Because that was British territory in that time. So it's a really cool little story. Um, so let's talk about a couple of issues, right? Um, so Marquette, at the end of the voyage, is at the St. Xavier Mission on the Fox River near today's Green Bay, okay? He takes off, Juliet and the rest of the guys take off, and they go to his trading post in Sault Ste. Marie. They winter there, and then in springtime, after ice off, these guys are taking all their stuff that they got from the voyage, and they are heading back to Quebec to show this stuff off, to meet with authorities and such. Unfortunately, right by these rapids right here, Joliet's canoe tipped over, okay? Everything was lost. Two of his hired hands, that Indian boy was lost. Everything they had collected was lost, okay? Fortunately, Marquette being a little smarter than the average bear, kept a copy of everything in Wisconsin. Okay, he made duplicates of this stuff. But the question is, is that the same map and same everything that he gave Joliet or did he add to it later? So it's one of those things we'll never know, but it's interesting to speculate. So did Marquette draw this map while they were going down the river? Or did he draw the map when he got it to St. Xavier's? Well, if he did, then Joliet probably had to stick around for a while chew the fat and wait till Marquette got done. So that's another question that we really can't answer. Marquette drew this stuff, but when did he do it? As they were going along or when they got to where they're going, okay? Then there's the mysterious Peoria village, okay? Marquette was pretty good at documenting village sites because they stopped there. Now, this is the last sentences, last couple sentences of his journal. Okay, it says, when we passed through the Illinois of Peoria, I preached the faith in all our cabins. While we were there, a dying child was brought to me, so on and so forth. But they stayed there three days or three nights. Marquette's map doesn't have anything on this. Marquette's report doesn't say anything. Um, so where was this village? Okay, and why is it on Marquette's map? Well, the, probably the reason for why it's not on Marquette's map is this is another one of them things that his supervisor stuck in there, okay? Because Marquette, they're going down the Illinois River School, all of a sudden they get to the end and, hey, we stopped at this Peoria village. And it's just out of sync, out of line. It's like, it's almost as if somebody took this and stuck it in a report, which is probably what happened. And what's kind of cool is they have this this is called a Manitoumi map. This is actually south. This is the Mississippi River here, and this would be the Illinois River right here in Chicago, would be right over here. And uh, what they did is, it's unfortunate, but a lot of these really good Jesuit scholars, some of these guys were awesome, but they have a habit of not contradicting. It's like the Marine Corps. They do not contradict their superiors or the earlier Jesuits. So when that is on, as we said, visited that Peoria village, stayed here three days when there's a dying child, they had to instead come up with some kind of story that, meet, that matched that. And this is what we have here in the 1681 map by uh, you know, Tizdek, uh, Thevena map right here. According, rather than say, that's not right, they concocted a story where these guys went all the way back up from the Arkansas village and stopped at that Peoria village again. And then you see the sign here, Chimene the, the returning, the returning route, the returning route home. If they did that, according to the Jesuits, they would have had to walk a hundred miles over the prairies of Northern Illinois. Okay, carrying canoes, carrying all this stuff. Do you really think they did that? No, there's no way they did that, okay? So, white Indian boy. Well, according to the French historian Lepatry, 
uh, who claimed, he claimed that he actually sat down and interviewed Juliet. He says the slave boy who accompanied him brought him back by this shorter route known as the Illinois River, okay? They gave him that kid because he had been to these other Indian villages before and he was a guide that could get them up the Illinois River because the Illinois River at that time was just islands, bays, backwaters. One of the largest wetlands in North America at Emaquan was there. There was false channels, there was sloughs, there was lakes on islands. It was a mess, it was a maze. Uh, French explorers like Henri Jotel in 1687, Henry Schoolcraft, the great Henry Schoolcraft in 1821, got so twisted up and lost in there, it took them like a day to get out, to extract themselves from these backwaters. That's why they gave him that boy. That boy, because there's a lot of rivers that dump into the Mississippi River, okay? He knew where the Illinois River was, and he got them to Kaskaskia, okay? This is a picture of Emaquan. <laughs> this is Emaquan right here. Which this is, was one of the largest, this is uh, south of Peoria near Lewiston, Illinois. It's the Illinois River there. This was one of the largest wetlands in the United States at that time. And what happened was because of the manipulation of the Illinois River, the reversal of the Chicago River, which a lot more water goes into the Illinois River, um, because of the levees, because of the lock and dam system, this whole area was drained and the state of Illinois, Nature Conservancy, the federal government and a lot of other conservation groups are buying this land up and restoring it to what it once was, which is really, really pretty cool. But since there's levees and things like that along the river, what would normally happen is in the springtime with the spring rains, these backwaters would flood, the seeds of the fish, founding fish would go in there, the ducks would nest, and as summer wore on, it'd go down, and then the plants would grow. They would grow all the feed that waterfall needs like this, and then the cycle would continue. But since these levees and systems are stopping all that from happening, these groups actually pump water into this area here to replicate what that once was like. And then as summer rolls along, they pump the water out for waterfall, which is really pretty cool. Um, Another thing is, why didn't Marquette note the, nap the rapids on the Illinois and Des Plaines River? Okay, he illustrated them on, on uh, his, uh, the Mississippi River and in Wisconsin. And we know there were rapids on the Illinois and Des Plaines River. That's why they dug the Illinois and Michigan Canal. Okay, uh, keep in mind too that he didn't mention other sets of rapids up in Michigan, and neither did Joliet. Okay, this is an 1883 map, Illinois River near Star Rock. Rapids, 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 these little zigzag things. These, these are depth. These are depth readings. And the Illinois River is only this deep. Okay. So why didn't he mention these things? Well, he did notice, or he did write, that there was a portage. See, this is that site right there where that huge Indian village was. So it was 1,480 people and by, by the year 1680, there were like 9,000 Illinois Indians living on that site right there. Star Rock is across the river along that tree line and about a mile that way. This is one of the most historic places in the central United States right there, okay? Marquette noticed that there was a, there was a portage there. Why? Because there was a rapids, you couldn't go by there. And that meant that there was aerated water. That's why you want to have a village site right uh, LaSalle, who built the fort on top of Star Rock, said that his fort was located on a portage of the Illinois River, okay? Um, Marquette did mention a couple of sets of rapids, but he didn't say anything about the Illinois River, and there's probably a really good reason for that. One of the reasons is because look how big and wide the Mississippi River is. They're all skinny. The Illinois River is, where are you going to put rapids? How would you show rapids in a skinny little river like that? It'd be kind of hard thing to do, okay? But on a big river, you can do that, okay? Um, another explanation was these French voyagers, these French canoemen, they never mentioned these things because it was part of travel. Just like if you were gonna write, you, something happened to you one day and you wanted to write this down, hey, this is really cool, man, I went and did this. Uh, would you write down it? I got stopped by two trains and 14 stoplights on the way there. 
No, it's just driving from one part of town to the next, you just, this part of travel. These rapids were more likely the same thing. They just, they were just part of travel. Matter of fact, there was 40 sets of rapids between Sault Ste. Marie and Montreal, the main canoe route, okay? Few of anybody even mentioned those, okay? Bottom line was, and you gotta remember this, so some, it's, it's tempting to say that, well, the river must have been flooded because Marquette didn't mention rapids, okay? Just because Marquette did not, did not mention rapids does not mean rapids weren't there, okay? He didn't mention seeing elk, bear, or anything like that either, but we know they were there. Same thing, okay? It's doubtful that the Illinois River was flooded in September of 1673, okay? Because Marquette himself wrote that the Illinois River greatly shortens our road and takes us with little effort to the Lake of the Illinois. I worked for the Illinois Department of Natural Resources for 25 years. I've been up and down the Illinois River in police boats and in work boats many, 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 many times. I worked the Great Flood in 1993 down in Calhoun County, a place that you wouldn't believe still exists in Illinois in this day and age, but it's interesting. Um, if there was, if that was flooded, let me tell you, it would take a lot of effort. This is very little effort, okay? Um, nothing mentioned about strong currents, flooded trees, anything like that, flooded debris, Okay, Marquette mentioned those things about the Mississippi, but he did not mention anything like that here. Okay, just because Marquette didn't mention them does not mean that the Illinois River was flooded. Okay, and a lot of these things here, we can't have metaphysical certitude. Okay, we can't say with absolute certainty this, but what we have to do is compare the evidence and make the probabilities. Okay, like when you look at the Illinois River, this is the Marseilles, right? Marseilles Dam. This is the remnants of the rapids by Marseilles. Who wrote about that? Conti in 1680, LaSalle wrote about them, Jotel wrote about them, Charlevoix wrote about them, Delisle wrote about them, Kennedy wrote about them, Hugh Hewitt, all these people wrote about that in American cartographers in 1690. They wrote about them because they were on missions and they had to get to point A and point B, but since they couldn't go any farther, they had to get horses and things like this. So it was a project. LaSalle wrote about these rapids because he was whining about Joliet. Uh, he wasn't expecting these kinds of rapids, okay? And if you look, this is the annual, you can see this is from the uh, pre-divergence 1879 all the way up to 1890-ish or so. You can see the cycle, spring, summer, spring, winter, summer. So this is how it flows, okay? And you can see right there that the Illinois River at times was almost dry. It was a trickle at times, okay? So once again, it's the probability. So did Marquette not write about the rapids? Did he not write about things because he was sick? It appears that Marquette was very sick during the last legs of his voyage. In fact, Marquette wrote very little about the Illinois Valley. He came to Illinois to teach, preach to, and convert those Indian tribes here near Star Rock. He really didn't write too much. Matter of fact, from all the way, from all the way to the Arkansas village, to Green Bay, he really wrote, with the exception of that four or five sentences that somebody stuck in there about that Peoria village, nine sentences, nine sentences for a 1300 mile trek. Whereas the first part of the voyage, oh man, these guys do all this kind of stuff, man. He put feathers on this and they do this and they trade with these people, so on and so forth, okay? Now his boss wrote the great hardships of his first voyage that brought upon him a bloody flux. He was bleeding from both ends. It so weakened him that he was, it was doubtful that he was gonna go a second time to Illinois, okay? He was sick and it took him 13 months to get healed. Okay, and then when he did leave, it came back and he died in 1675 from that, okay? So these have just been a couple of observations of mine about Marquette's map and Julia's voyage, okay? So places, features, and such. And this is Miami, Illinois from 350 years ago. Newe, that means thank you in their language. With that, thank you.
Anybody have any questions? Anything? Clear as mud? Oops, did you back up? I escaped. <laughs> uh, it's so if Marquette was a Jesuit, could you just compare him like Juliet and LaSalle? So I think like Juliet was not a religious, he was a traitor. Well, Juliet went to the um, best Jesuit school because they didn't have public schools. If you were rich, you had a tutor. Okay. If you, uh, or you could send your kids to a Jesuit college because they owned the colleges at that time. They had the best. So Marquette and LaSalle went to the good Jesuit schools in France. Okay. They had the top notch education. Canada had a Jesuit school too, but it was nothing like those that they had in France. I right? kind of like compare it to a community college or something like that. It was the best that Canada had. But it was nothing like those. Joliet left the priesthood in 1667. He was basically a church clerk and a musician. Okay. Um, later in life, he became this famous guy. Jo uh, LaSalle was just uh, plain. He couldn't be, you could not restrain this guy. He wanted out. Okay. He went to these same Jesuit schools too. And he became so much of a pain in the butt that they, he said, I got to get out of here. And they let him go, okay? And so most of these people, or a lot of these people, had these pretty good educations. So these guys weren't dummies, okay? It just had some real serious character flaws. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you started out with a, a painting of Marquette. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed all the statues and things that it always looks different for everyone. Uh, yeah, we really- Is that what he really looked like? <laughs> <laughs> Metaphysical certitude. Um, that image, that likeness of Marquette, was found somewhere in Quebec or something in an attic, in an attic someplace where they find, like my colleague Michael McCafferty found Father Panay, who had the mission here in Chicago in 1696. He found his word list, his dictionary, found it in in some attic in Montreal or something like that, and so. In one of those places, they found this drawing, this sketch, and it said, Père Marquette. And so maybe there's another Marquette. I, I don't know. But so that has been a template that you use. If you Google Marquette and you see this kind of like old looking picture, that was what, that's an image of what they found. That painting or that image there comes from the Star Rock Visitor Center. Cause we got all those historical people there. So it's really cool. Like my book came out, I got, got next to Marquette, you're pointing at the book and it looks like we're on the same side. <laughs> Do they suspect he had power or what did they suspect he had? They don't know. Uh, there's There's been some discussion about it, but it was definitely some kind of internal stomach thing. Um, well, he, he's No, it's, it's possible because you know, he mentioned earlier that when he wanted out that he wanted to go to the mission fields while he was still young. He may have had some kind of condition then, perhaps, you know, kind of built tales together. When um, was he born and when did he die? He was born in 1637. <laughs> That's why I always bone up on my own book when I go here, because it's like taking a final exam <laughs> in my own stuff. I uh, born in 1637. In La Own, France, not Lyon, but La Own, which is northern France. And he died in 1675, presumably on the uh, Marquette River in Michigan, lower Michigan. He left the Illinois village at Kaskaskia. He was on basically on his deathbed. They tried to get him to St. Ignace, to the other Jesuit mission up there. There was no medical care, but at least maybe he could just sit and relax for a while. And probably his constitution couldn't handle drinking muddy river water and being in areas where there's yellow fever and stuff like that. Yes. Uh, Mark, uh, yeah. for the people online, Mark, for the people online, would you repeat questions so they can hear the question? Okay, one more time, ma'am. I'm sorry. Where yeah. do I find a copy of your book? Uh, right here. <laughs> in, in a little box. I was trying to understand when I drive down from David Avenue, there's a, a little statue of the Royal to Marquette. Yeah, yeah. And it's just, uh, yeah. They said one time it's closer to the river, they moved it up so we could. For you folks on Zoom, the question was where can you buy a book? Yeah. But it's, it's going to do you no good because it's right here. <laughs> or you can get it at a local bookstore, it'd be great. 
or uh, you can get it from Amazon. But if you if you get it and and you like it, please go to Amazon and either give it a review, even if it's just stars. And the reason why I do that is because the next book publishers look at see well how was that last book taken uh, yeah. okay well they got a lot of good reviews on that one yeah okay great we'll talk to you mm -hmm. so that's why so. but it's interesting on this memorial to Marquette mm -hmm. they, sometimes they spell the name wrong they oh the name they're wrong. yeah they've <laughs> and that's what makes it hard following this stuff <laughs> yes sir I have a couple of observations about my boy so I read that the the giving of a slave like that from one party to another was a form of diplomacy. It was mm -hmm. common between the tribes mm -hmm. and uh, the, uh, the chief that gave it to, it was more to Joliet as a representative of sure. the French Canadian government, et cetera. Sure, you know, yeah, yeah. The question was uh, the, about the boy was, as being part of diplomacy also, as a guide, but they did this commonly. That's how Marquette learned the Miami, Illinois language when he was in Wisconsin at the uh, at the mission up there. They gave him a instructor. A, a, they called him a slave too. That taught him the rudiments of language. I have a quote from the letter that Joliet wrote uh, after the canoe capsized and, and he lost all his papers. Can I read just the, the sentence or two in sure. that letter? Sure. He said. Um, when I was about to reach Montreal, my canoe capsized and I lost two men in a box wherein were all my papers, my journal, as well as some curios from those far off lands. Mm -hmm. I am much grieved over the loss of a 10 year old slave mm -hmm. who had been presented to me. He was of a good disposition, quick witted, diligent, and obedient. He could express himself in French and beginning to read and write. Pretty cool. So he seemed to care more about the loss of the boy than the loss of all his papers. It's kind of an interesting. Yeah, and there's that the, the whole pay idea of him writing a journal and papers is that came up several years later. You know, uh, anyway. You mentioned a number of times various tribes. Mm -hmm. What are we talking about in numbers? Is there 2,000 people in the tribe or 80,000 people? Uh, best, best records indicate roughly 1677 or about 9,600 Illinois altogether. Okay. Some of these tribes are rather large. Um, Iroquois. And what would happen is sometimes after they, with, with the Iroquois, for example, went into the upper Great Lakes and took over everything. There's a couple of lakes up there that you've heard of Lake Erie, okay, Lake Huron. So where are the Eries and the Hurons? They don't exist anymore, right? Because the ones that survived the Iroquois were, they, since they spoke the same language, were incorporated into the Iroquois group. So these tribes, and especially when the Frenchmen came out and gave these people diseases where three quarters of the village would die, okay? Now we went from several thousand people to a handful of people, and so, the numbers, it's all very dynamic. Okay. Do you think Marquette and Joliet, when he met the Indians, were they building casinos then? <laughs> <laughs> they went under the Mackinac Bridge. Yeah. Mark, <laughs> let's include the people online. Okay. So got Paul, Great. Paul, you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yeah, could we put that map back up? Sure. Uh, the one that shows the Chicago area, you know, the Kaskaskia map? Uh, the, the Kaskaskia portion of the map. All right, I'm going to do this here. Because uh, what a great map. That one there? Or you want Yeah. To... Okay. So you had a close up when yeah. you were talking about Kaskaskia? Yeah, there you go. That one. Right yeah. there. Right there, that's the one part of the map that I get excited about because uh, right there at the southwest corner of Lake Michigan, you have the angle of one shore meeting the angle of the other shore. And right at the Indiana line, the radius of those shorelines makes a definite 
change in the beach. It's uh, right where the Illinois state line is now, right where the, the uh, uh, right where those casinos are at right now. Yeah, and well, you, you can see you can see this on the map that he actually was there at that southwest mm -hmm. corner of Lake Michigan. Well, you can see that once again, all this great detail, and you get over here and there's nothing like up at this plains and that. So yep. it's kind of like, was he sick? Did he run out of ink? You know, so it's you know, there's it, it's speculation, but yep. with that's he still drew a pretty darn good map. Thanks, guys. My battery's running out. This was a lot of fun. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Is there any mention of uh, repairing the canoes or any of the work they did to keep them going? Yeah, they, they did. Every time they found pitch, they would always bring pitch with them to be able to do that. When they come across rapids, they usually would walk them because some of those some of those rocks are real sharp to tear, tear the canoes. The Indians down here didn't use birch bark. They used what are called masuda. They called it masuda which are dugouts. French called them pirogues, the Indians called them masura, and they were, um, yeah, they were kind of indestructible. Uh, whose recitation or, or presentation of Marquette's work, where, where is it found? Because the Jesuit relations, they stopped in like 1672, before Marquette actually wrote the stuff. We presume they set it on to his superiors, mm -hmm. but you're saying it's all available it's online. online. So yeah. who other just go to Google. Just go to Google. the question is about Marquette or getting access to the Jesuit relations. Just go to Google Jesuit Relations Volume 59. That's Marquette's journal or Marquette's report, and that's in there. If you want to see what happened when Joliet met Joliet met with the Canadian officials. That's Jesuit Lations 58. Volume 60 is when Father Alloways came to Illinois and, and uh, ministered at the village here at this Kaskaskia village. So it's all there. All 67 volumes are online. It's through Creighton University. But, but they, stopped, they stopped publishing them before in, in Yeah, right. In, in Europe, they did that. Right. Yes. They still did that. But still, when you I, read I, it, I understand it. I, I believe that they exist, but yeah. in what form? Because they were not published. In As, they didn't, yeah. they may not have had a book company do this, print these things, but they had the papers, they had the documents. Mm -hmm. They just didn't make books out of them. At the end of the yeah. 1800s, in the early 1900s, uh, Ruben Gold Quates took on the job of. Right. Organizing all these materials, bringing them from all over the world. So yeah. actually, they right. did they bring them from Rome? Did they bring them from France? In addition, they, in addition right. to the journals that were published up to uh, 1672, mm -hmm. they compiled letters and reports. And Reuben was the one who built the rest of the Jesuit relations wow. for the other years. Right. So they put in letters and journals. Marquette's. The Gabon account survived in Canada. A copy was sent to France. A copy from France was then sent to Rome. That's the one intact copy that still survives. It was sent back to France. There are several pieces of that journal because many copies were made in France. They survived. They're in the archives. So mm -hmm. what Thwaites did was he compiled these things and published them in what he called number 59. Tip volume 59. Volume 59. So those are um, Alves's uh, last uh, report, um, the Blown's letter to uh, Penay is in there. Um, right. They were, so they, they, had, they were contemporaneous reports, but they weren't published. Correct. They were contemporaneous. Correct. And nothing after 1672 was published. Correct. Well, Correct. But, but it was published. So there was a book by a French writer named Fevenot. Right. Wrote a book in 1681. There's a copy at the uh, Newberry Library. And he left out what he called the pious parts, but most of it is word for word of Marquette's journal in volume, which is, ended up being published in uh, volume 59 of the journal. But if you compare the two paragraphs, word for word, page by page, 
They're identical. One of the copies made in France. So it went to France, 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 France and Devineau got a copy. Right. If, if, if you want to know the, the skinny on all that, get Raphael Hamilton. He's a Jesuit historian. Marquette's, yeah. Mar, Marquette's uh, uh, journal re-examined or something. Yeah. He goes into minute detail, even from the watermarks on the paper yeah. and where he got these different copies from. It, like LaSalle, how do we know what's everything about LaSalle? It was uh, Francis Parkman went to Paris and met with, with um, Pierre Margret and they got all these little bits and pieces from all these different libraries and stuff and created Margret's six volumes. I, I was reading once. I was reading once. Uh, that some, Father Marquette, I think he was here in Chicago. I think it was here in Chicago. And he created, sometimes they had nicknames for everybody. So when they, he wrote things, things, things down, they had nicknames. So you never really find out who these people are who are wandering in back and forth. I think it was Father Marquette, I swear to it, but just. Yeah, yeah, they had uh, the question was is they had nicknames, uh, um, all these French guys, and that's when you see a name, it'll say Dit D I T, you know, Pierre, Pierre, um, Moreau, yeah. Dit Le Castor, the beaver, or something like that. So every time you see Dit in a French name, it means this is what they call, them. Yeah. you know, this is Bob and the it, mechanic or something. For some reason, they didn't really give, give the real names for the reason right. I don't know. They don't quite understand why it's so it's hard to track. Yeah, it's like where I grew up in Harvey, everybody. Yeah, I, no one knew anybody's name. <laughs> How far did their the expedition get get into the Mississippi? All the way down to the Arkansas River. To where? Arkansas River. And then they turned around and came back. Turned around and came back, but went up the Illinois River. Yeah. How long were they gone? They were gone from uh, May 17th to Marquette got out sometime in September late September-ish, and Joliet continued on all the way to Sault Ste. Marie, and we really don't know when exactly, October. He just wanted to beat the snow, <laughs> is what he wanted to do. So I tell you what I'm going to do, folks. I'm going to thank you very much for coming. Uh, I know anybody has bladders like mine, you're probably glad to get out of this room. So, so I'm going to thank you so much for coming. I will stick around to answer questions, okay?